the renegade mathematician here with a friendly warning this video contains a real mathematical proof so if you got the guts I would strongly recommend you follow along with a piece of paper a pencil or pen whatever and you pause the video as soon as you don't know what the hell I'm talking about so there you go proceed with caution going to go ahead and continue our discussion of permutations and cycles and uh, we're going to talk about permutations as products of cycles and with that comes our first big theorem and this will be a little bit challenging uh, for a proof but here we go theorem one every permutation is either is either the identity a single cycle or the product of disjoint cycles. So what we're saying is it has to fall into one of those three categories. Every single permutation is one of those three things. Okay, let's start our proof. And we're going to start that off by saying let P be any permutation on the set 1 through N. Why any permutation? Because the statement of the theorem says every permutation is either the identity a single cycle or the product of disjoint cycles and so we have to choose a permutation arbitrarily we can't cherry pick a permutation we just have to say here's a um, an arbitrary permutation and then prove that the statement holds so P is any permutation on the set 1 through n now if P of K is equal to K for all K in the set 1 through n then P is by definition the identity and we are done. That's the first category, right? That uh, The identity permutation. And r recall that the identity permutation is the permutation that takes every number in the set 1 through n and maps it to itself. It doesn't move it, right? So if I plug in 1, I get 1. If I plug in 2, I get 2, right? 1 goes to the first position, 2 goes to the second position, so on and so forth. But that's exactly what we would have if we let the permutation P map K to K for all K in the set 1 through N. Let's move on here. Suppose instead that P is not the identity. Well, then there exists a K in the set 1 through N such that P of K is not K. Otherwise, P would be the identity, right? In other words, if P isn't the identity, then there has to be some number in there that it doesn't just leave alone, right? It moves it to some number that's not K. It moves K somewhere other than K, right? Okay, let A sub 1 in the set 1 through N be the first element such that P of A sub 1 is not equal to A sub 1. So first we we stated that there has to be some number in there that doesn't get mapped to itself and now we're saying a sub 1 is the first of those numbers let's say that's the first one in the set okay let a sub 2 be equal to p of a sub 1 let a sub 3 be equal to p of a sub 2 and continue that process so on so forth until eventually we reach a sub m which is equal to P of A sub I, where A sub I is some number in the set of numbers A sub 1 through A sub M. Those are all the numbers that we've already gotten to, right? Those are all of the numbers in the sequence that we've already defined. So in other words, what we're saying is we let A sub 2 equal to P of A sub 1. We let A sub 3 be equal to P of A sub 2. And then eventually we get to a number where we repeat ourselves, right? Where A sub M is some number that 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 is um, that we've we've already gotten to right. It's p of a sub i, and a sub i is some number we've already we've already been to, right. And note that this must happen at some point because this process can't go on forever. There are finitely many numbers from one to n. That's why we will eventually end up repeating ourselves. Moving on. Okay, now let's consider some options here. If a sub i is equal to a sub m, let's consider that possibility then. 
then we will have p of a sub m equal to a sub m. Now why is that? Why is that? Well, you should verify why that is. Um, what you should do is you should take the equation, our assumption, a sub i is equal to a sub m, and I want you to evaluate both sides of that equation. Take p of the left side and p of the right side, and then see what you come up with by substitution. You will eventually arrive at p of a sub m is equal to a sub m. Actually, you will immediately arrive at that. Um, but go ahead and verify that. Pause the video and take that equation a sub i equal to a sub m and uh, take p of both sides and see what you get. Moving on though. And since we already have a sub m equal to p of a sub m minus 1 by construction, remember that's how we were constructing that sequence of numbers, right? recursively. a sub 2 is equal to p of a sub 1. a sub 3 is equal to p of a sub 2, right? So then a sub m is going to be equal to p of a sub m minus 1, right? That's how we constructed that sequence. But anyway, since a sub m is equal to p of a sub m minus 1 by construction, p is not injective, or 1 to 1 if you prefer that term. Why? Why? Because then we have p of a sub m is equal to a sub m, and we have p of a sub m minus 1 is also equal to a sub m. That's not 1 to 1, right? That's not an injective function. This is a contradiction since all permutations must be injective. Thus, we have to have a sub i not equal to a sub m. So this is an example of a proof by contradiction here. We supposed that a sub i was equal to a sub m and we arrived at a contradiction so thus we have to recant right, that hypothesis and say, well, after all, a sub i can't be equal to a sub m. Moving on. In fact, if a sub i is equal to any number other than a sub 1, we will arrive at the same contradiction. And you should verify that. Pick any number. Pick any number other than a sub, um, a sub 1, and you will arrive at that very same contradiction. OK? And because of that fact, we must have a sub i equal to a sub 1 because that is the only number that it could be equal to without a contradiction. And therefore, and therefore, a sub m is equal to p of a sub 1. Why is that? Well, take the equation a sub i equals a sub 1 and evaluate p of both sides and you will get the equation a sub m is equal to p of a sub 1. So what have we done? What has all this mess accomplished? Well, we have thus far defined the cycle a sub 1 through a sub m, right? You should have figured that's where we were heading, right? By constructing this sequence of numbers, what we've done is we've constructed a cycle where eventually we get to some point we come full circle, right? It goes a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, all the way to a sub m, at which point it goes all the way back to a sub 1, right? That's what we just did. So thus far, we have defined the cycle a sub 1 through a sub m. That's what we've done. So this is the second category, right? If all the numbers in the set 1 through n appear in the cycle a sub 1 through a sub m, then p is the single cycle a sub 1 through a sub m, and we're done. Done. Um, of course, the other possibility is that there are some numbers that we missed in the set 1 through n, right? We could have missed some. All right, moving on. Suppose there is at least one number in the set 1 through n that does not appear in the cycle a sub 1 through a sub m. Let b sub 1 be the first such number in the set 1 through n. Okay, so now we're supposing, supposing that we missed a number. And let's let b sub 1 be the first of those numbers that we missed. If b sub 1 is the only such number, then we have p of b sub 1 is equal to b sub 1. In this case, p is just the cycle, a sub 1 through a sub m, and we are done. Remember that if b sub 1 doesn't appear in the cycle, uh, then by default it's just left alone, right? Moving on. Suppose otherwise, that there are multiple numbers in the set 1 through n that do not appear in the cycle a sub 1 through a sub m. 
then we may repeat the previous procedure until we have yet another cycle. Let's call it b sub 1 through b sub r, right? We can create, we can construct yet another cycle in exactly the same way that we constructed the previous cycle from the remaining numbers, right? And by producing cycles in this matter, we must eventually run out of numbers in the set 1 through n and have a product p equal to the cycle a sub 1 through a sub m times the cycle b sub 1 through b sub r, so on and so forth, right? Eventually we run out of numbers to make cycles with, right? And note that this is a product of cycles which are by construction disjoint, right? None of the b's are the same as the a's. So what have we done here? We started by assuming it was our permutation was the identity and then supposing it's not the identity, in which case it could be a single cycle, but supposing it's not just a single cycle, then it has to be a product of disjoint cycles, as we've just constructed. So we've proved our theorem right there, QED. Okay, that's done. And in the next video, we'll go ahead and prove the following proposition, that every cycle can be expressed as the product of one or more transpositions. But that's next time, so I'll see you there.